morning everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to start being aggressive as I am always, <laughs> but I'm really, uh, when I mean meetings, when I mean those big, nice buildings, I always think what was going on 18 years ago, where, which meetings were taking place, which, so there, there is such, um, uh, distance between the places, Geneva, New York, and wherever where decisions are being made, and Kigali or Rwanda, or wherever where the people are suffering. And I don't know, I always hope, perhaps with your, what you are doing now, what HAP is doing, what uh, organizations are doing, are trying to do, perhaps can we make sure that this gap is filled, that what is happening there and what people are discussing here or there can be really linked so that the catastrophe can be, can be yeah, avoided. It was not the case in Rwanda, it was 94. So it is exactly now, April, it is exactly 18 years. I was there with my family, I was married, I was happy, I was having three children, my husband was a teacher in a secondary school, my parents were old, they were living in the village, okay, like any Rwandese, the only difference being that we were always stigmatized with this uh, ethnicity in our ID card, we were Tutsis. The old knows, it was not unknown at the moment. In this April 94, I remember the UN was there. This has been our big mistake. We have been thinking because the UN is there, nothing cannot happen. We didn't run away. We were feeling secure. And it was a lie. On the 6th of April, when this uh, plane for the, the, the president was shut down, I was on, an, uh, on a maternity leave. I used to work for Oxfam UK. I was deputy regional representative for Oxfam Rwanda, Burundi, and Kivu, Eastern Congo. So luckily, I was on, on a maternity leave and I was not in a meeting with the staff in Gisenyi on the border with Congo. If I have been there, I, I would not be here because everybody who was there, all the Tutsis who were in the places have been killed. <coughs> so when it started, we, it was not really clear what is happening. Uh, as I said, my husband was a professor, was a teacher in secondary school. So we couldn't get out, we couldn't run anywhere because it was, we were surrounded by roadblocks immediately roadblocks were erected all over the places. So for us, it was impossible to go anywhere. We, your ID card were checked, and if you were two, you were put on the side and you were killed. So we just have to, we tried to go in the school where he used to teach, it was an internet, it was holiday, yeah, it was Easter. So because it was holiday, there was space. We went in the dormitory of the, the, the students, with all the colleagues, with friends also who tried to reach the, the place. But later on, we have been, uh, yeah, we, th we thought we were safe, but it was not. We were, somebody has betrayed us, and actually, in three days, the 30th of April, this is the day the, the soldiers and the militia came in our place, and they took all the, for, uh, first they took the men and the boys, so they took my husband and the, all the, the colleagues, and they took them to the roadblock, the next roadblock to kill them. Um, in the end, in July, everything was over, and I discovered that I have lost nearly everybody, so my husband was killed, the whole family of my husband, they were all killed, for, from seven children and uh, grandchildren, there's only one sister who survived. My parents were all killed, even though they were old, my sister and her children, my aunt and my uncles, so, <coughs> so you find yourself, or I found myself, in a such emptiness, a layer, there's nobody anymore. Who, who are you without your people? Who are you now with? But I, I really have to say I was really lucky because at least my three small daughters were, were survived six months, three years, and five years. So at least I have a reason why to, to try to continue to, to try to, to stay alive. But for the survivors, what is really on our mind, even 18 years later, is that the way the people have been killed, uh, I was going to be cynical to say to kill is okay, to kill is not okay, but 
the way they, they were killed, even this uh, atrocious way, this keeps uh, going on your mind and this keeps um, making you, un uh, yeah, yeah, you can't rest without that. And the worst, I think, was also not to bury the people. You just have to run for your own safety, but in your mind you keep, you, you keep thinking on the bodies you have left on the on the roads. I remember one of my, ter I was terrifying any time I was driving and to see a dog, uh, dead dog on the street, I, I would really make an accident because you just have a flash, you see your, your, your husband or your mom or your sister because they have just been left on, um, on the street. Of course we lost everything, not only lost everybody but lost everything. Everything was destroyed, there was no house anymore. The, the, the cows, they have been all killed, they have been, everything has been looted. So you find yourself at the end of it, there are no guns anymore, there's no killings anymore, but you find yourself in a such, um, yeah, emptiness. It is, everything is, is uh, empty, there's nowhere you can, uh, where are you going to sit, where are you going to, to lie, where are you going to, to hide your misery? There's no door to close your, your, your room, there's no room, there's nothing. So it was a total, total uh, distraction. Um, but I think what was the, the most difficult for me is the loss of the trust in human being and humanity. The people who, were, who have been killing us, they were not a foreign army. And this is the worst with a, with a genocide. The propaganda has been so growing, growing, making making sure in the minds of our, our neighbors, in the minds of our friends, in the mind of our teachers, that we are the enemy. And you finish by believing, you, you believe that they are enemy. But I'm not, uh, it's not, an, I just have to make, pay attention. What the media have been saying, those barbar, uh, savages, Africa, it's not true at all. The same procedure went on here in Germany. Uh, we are not in Germany, excuse me. <laughs> it went on in Germany. How slowly, slowly the Jews have been categorized and they are no human beings and they are dangerous and you have to get rid of them. So really, again, I want to, to, to say pay attention at the procedure, which in the end will make somebody totally uh, yeah, dangerous and you have to get rid of him. And I think in the end, the people believe it. But God say dark, there are people who will resist and there are people who will, there are not so many, but at least they, they are. And this is what, somewhere reconciling me with the with humanity but this loss of trust in human beings i tell you after the, uh, the end of the genocide i could trust anybody i have seen priests i have seen nuns i have seen women i have seen teachers i have seen doctors i have seen uh, friends of school who, who were killing the others so how can i trust anymore how can but how can i live without trusting and don't tell me, I'm telling you, so there's lost of trust in my neighbors, in my people. But what about this famous humanity, <coughs> humanitarian? Uh, for a long time, I really ran away from the humanitarians. They were there. But when it became serious, when it became dangerous, at least you have the chance. They pack you. You have your countries who are coming and left. They, they came and they took all the expatriates. They put them in the, on, on the flight. And what? What cannot really go away of my, my mind? I remember I, I, there was one good friend in Belgium. I asked her. She agreed to take my children. They refused to take my children. But they took the dogs of the Belgian and they took the cats of the French. And I tell you since then, I said, okay, it's clear. Tell me about humanitarian human beings, the value, the right. No. I know that even a cat, a, dog, a Belgian cat or a French dog, has more, has more value as my children, as the Tutsi children in Rwanda. So <clears throat> when you find yourself in a such loss of everything, <coughs> there's nothing on which you can really grab to, to, to hold on. And remember the worst for, for, our, uh, for Rwanda, for the society, uh, when I think about it, there was no, no way to greet somebody. Usually in Rwanda, when you greet someone, you, you have to wish, the, the, the eldest have to wish something to the youngest. So if there's a young woman, you wish him, you wish her a husband, Yirumugab, that is very common. But in this time, you are really afraid of wishing somebody a husband because she's probably, there are many chances that she's a widow and you will be hurting her. Children, you wish them uh, parents, Yirasuna Nyoko, 
Now you are afraid of wishing your children and your parents. They are killed. Those children are orphans. So I can't. You, you of all, oh, we wish cows, I'm not sure. But I can't wish you cows, they have been all eaten. Oh, for the Christian, it is yes, uh, God may, Jesus may be um, glorified. But Jesus, how can, I, how can I glorify him anymore? Because people have been killed in the churches, in his presence. In they, the, the songs of the propaganda, of the hate was, even God is gone. So I remember really being in a society where you cannot even greet. Just to, 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 make, to, to, to make you feel how, how the destruction was total. But um, thanks God, I think, yeah, if I am here <laughs> and I'm not the only one, there are survivors who have made it to be alive and to be alive alive. This was our motto. As Annabelle said, we decided we have no choice, we have no family anymore, so we, we have to make a family even if it was an artificial one, but we did, at least for the widows. Immediately we were meeting friends and friends and we started this widows association, Avega. In Kinyarwanda we call it Agahozo. And this means <coughs> what you sing, a, a nice song to, to, uh, for, for your child, for your baby when, when she or he's crying, to, to, uh, to dry the tears. Agahozo is drying the tears. So we said, let a girl, if we want to survive, we want, if we want not to get mad, actually we are thinking that we are mad, we are going mad. We didn't know about trauma. This was later on that it comes to know the theory and this, uh, uh, all these uh, symptoms. <coughs> but by doing this association together, by creating this Avega, it helps really us first to give a new meaning uh, at our lives. I have sisters, I'm no longer alone. So in bad times we are together, in good times we are together. We will learn to laugh again. We will learn first to share, to cry together. You have a space, you have a family, and this has been really very helpful. But not only this uh, psychological, this emotional side, but also the very practical things. I remember that one who has, still has a um, uh, roof, uh, still has a house, still has a shelter. We have to share. So we used to be 20 in a house, we have to be more than that. If you still have some beans and some rice, we have to share. Some clothes, if you still have some kanga, you will share. <coughs> and we started fighting, fighting to recover, to be again alive, alive. And of course, we, the, the worst in our case, the worst what we started to discover, which was really terrible, is that during the whole time, Fast, nearly all the survivors, the women surviving, or more than 80, we did a survey, more than 80 who survived have been raped through the whole three months. And 94 in Rwanda was the time AIDS was already a pandemic. So we realized that those we, women, our members have been, who have been raped have been infected with AIDS. And they were dying, and they were dying. And we have to fight again to try to get medication for them. We have to try to fight to make this, um, this systematic rape to be recognized in the international community, to be recognized in this uh, international tribunal in Arusha. I remember one of our big success was that the, the rape was recognized and it uh, now it is, uh, there is a big um, punishment for, for, the, for the rape. And we are proud of that, that we have achieved that. But in the same time, when we try to, 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 to say, please, the women who are coming to testify, the women who are strong and are talking about it, they need, to kept, to, to have, they need medication to be alive, to be kept alive. Because in the same time, in the time we were, we were talking in this Arusha tribunal, the, the killers who have been raping, who have AIDS, from day one, they have been treated. They were having this uh, antiretroviral since day one. The women were not having it. And we were saying, they, where, where is the justice? The women who are testifying, they are dying. So in a few years, you don't have a single test, uh, one who, who will be testifying because they are dying. Uh, I remember the, uh, the tribunal telling us that they are not a hospital. So we have to go through a lot of uh, yeah, deception, but we uh, got Saidang, we kept. Yeah, fighting. One of the, I, I told you, we tried to have a house, we tried to have a cow back, we tried to have medication so that we can be alive, alive. But we tried also to bring, like to bring back our people. We have to bury 
You cannot go ahead if you have not buried your people. But most of the time, until now, we are searching for bodies. And if you, you can't make this exercise, how can you go ahead and be, be free in yourself and feel that you, you have done your, 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 your job, your responsibility towards your people? And I, <coughs> I think this is where we, we, we tried also to say, let us find, even if it is a symbolic way of burying them, and this is, I'm going to share just the, 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 the final um, experience. Um, I was lucky, I was lucky, <laughs> I'm very lucky. Uh, with, with Oxfam, I got a sabbatical year. I went to UK and I trained as a psychotherapist. And I worked in a one-to-one -one settings. Later on, uh, yeah, with my organization, with the widows and the orphans. Later on, I got remarried with a German guy. This is why I'm based in Germany, even though I'm going all the time to Rwanda. But to get this distance from Rwanda, to have this time, to not being uh, busy with the everyday life of the organization or of everybody in Rwanda trying to rebuild, I had the chance to, to be, to, to run away, to be going all around, to be talking, to be raising awareness of what was going on. We got this, we started to get this medication for the widows. We have a very nice project, a cow for every widow. And I will get some funding from you too. <laughs> I'm impossible. But then I had the chance really to put on, to write about all those things. Why I'm linking that with the, with the, the, the mooning uh, thing. Our, our, our goal was the killers, they wanted to finish or they wanted to read this annihilation. I remember even the, 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 the road going to my parents, they, they destroyed everything, even the road which was going there, to make like there was nothing there. And our challenge, or at least my challenge in writing the books, the first one called Survivant in French, Survivant, Survivors, but we Vivant with um, uh, capital letter, because we wanted to say we are alive, alive, or we want to be alive, alive but not only as the survivors, but also our people. So that the last image of my husband is not somebody, is not a, bo uh, a body on the road. Or my old mom of 80 is not a naked woman, uh, old woman among bodies. I wanted to give them again their life, to describe who they were, how lively they were, what they were doing, what was their life. Because then this is, um, they have a life again. What was their life? So for the future, for the transmission to the young generation, they have to know not only the, the bad images which were left in 94, but they have to create, they have to know where am I coming, and then they can get strength from those. And this was a way of, for, for, for me, and many of the survivors are doing it. Those are ways, those are symbolic ways we are using to bury them, to bury them in a very dignifying way, but also to transmit something to the, to the new generation. Uh, the second book, the La Fleur de Stéphanie, was about my sister who was never recovered. Where are the bodies? Where they are in the toilet, they are in um, shit, excuse me for the word. And you can't accept that this is the last, uh, the last uh, place for your sister. But on the other hand, you have no choice. So I was really lucky to find that she had planted a flower when we were young at our play, parents' houses. Of course, everything has been destroyed, there's nothing at all. But it was really funny that when I went there in the ruins, I found the small flower was still there. There was still something, something which was refusing to die. So I thought, no, this is really a, uh, a sign that Stephanie is somewhere. So we are trying to find those uh, those flowers, those trees, those uh, songs, what they used to like, so that they can be alive again, so that we can leave them, uh, uh, how can I say, so that we can win on the worst. And perhaps to close with that, <laughs> if not I'm going to start to, to cry, I think what we see now with Rwanda, 18 years later, I really think, I have a, 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 an image in my head of course, all my images are with cows. <laughs> uh, when we're young, when in Rwanda you have your, you have the, the, you have the house and you have the lanclo, you have the, the fence, uh, and the cows they are sleeping in the, 
in the court, in, not a court, in the in the yard, and they are sleeping in the yard. And in mornings, when you take them to uh, in the field, yeah, then the, the girls have to clean the yard. And there's a place be, behind the yard where we put all the manure. And of course, you can imagine that hill of manure, it is so stinking, it is not really the best place to have a chat. <laughs> but near this place where you don't have to have a chat because it's stinking, because it's so... Eh, this is the place where you will get the best pumpkin. This is the place where the pumpkin coming there, or a banana growing there, it will make such big fruit. So this is the lesson we are trying for Rwanda. We are trying to say, let us at least from our manure, from our stinking story, from what happened, let us at least uh, grow something. And so this is why I liked when you said yesterday you were growing and flourishing. And this time we are not really doing it from pleasure, from it is not a hobby, it is unfortunately our story, but it is fortunately a turning around, using it, yeah, in the best way. I thank you.